Hello, hello, and welcome once again to another exciting edition of a Beatles show called Things We Said Today. I'm Ken Michaels, and most of you know me from a syndicated radio show that I host on the Beatles called Every Little Thing. And this program, Things We Said Today, is a weekly show uh, dealing with what's going on in Beatle news. We take one particular topic and we expand on it. And joining me is Beatles examiner Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Uh, hi, everybody. How are you doing? Today's show, we're going to be talking about something that's been in the news quite a lot because this particular year of 2012 marked the 50th anniversary of a lot of things in Beatle history. It's, it's a very significant year. Uh, what happened 50 years ago in 1962, there's so many things of historical importance connected to the Beatles, going back to January 1st, their deck audition recording. You can go to uh, the date of June 6th, which is when they had their very first audition at EMI Studios, and that was with Pete Best. Also, Pete Best was fired on August the 16th. Ringo officially became a member and did his first show as, as an official member of the group on August the 18th. Then uh, September 4th, they had um, their recording session at EMI. And another one on September the 11th, and it's all important to discuss as uh, we celebrate, well, the main thing is the 50th anniversary of the Beatles' first single on Parlophone, EMI, that being Love Me Do, backed with P.S. I Love You. So looking back at 1962, so many incredible things, important things in Beatle history happened that year. It really did, and, you know, what's really funny is, uh, and I'm going to kind of take a kind of a... a an interesting view here that, you know, the Beatles did so much and accomplished, you know, had such an impact on pop culture that the 50th anniversary thing is, is certainly a, an interesting milestone. But they did so much all over the place that it's the, the 50th anniversary thing is, is, to me, is not maybe the the big thing that everybody seems to make it, if you understand what I'm trying to say. We all know what kind of an impact they had, especially the last few years, the things that have been coming out. And it's great that that the Beatles are apparently finally going to actually celebrate one of their anniversaries. I mean, they let so many anniversaries go. Beatles fans are, are just really crazy about bringing up 40th anniversaries and 30th anniversaries. And, you know, they they did reissue the, um, the White Album CD. Uh, I think that was the 30th anniversary CD. But now they're actually, you know, there's actually supposed to be a 50th anniversary Love Me Do uh, single um, that, um, you know, is supposed to come out uh, on the 50th anniversary. And uh, it's great that the Beatles are finally looking at their history. And to their, it seems to be taking it more seriously all the way around. Hmm. Um, I've always um, been, been told, right or wrong, that they kind of frown on anniversary dates and hearing... 50 years ago, 40 years ago, because it really makes you aware of how long ago that was. You know, I don't know what the, I don't know what the reason they haven't done this before. Maybe they're, you know, maybe it's the age thing. Maybe they, you know, they don't want to, because both Ringo and Paul especially are caught up in their own, you know, present day, you know, present day music. I right. mean, Ringo, of course, and they, they don't really want to get too caught up or, to pull back by what they did. But, and, and like I said, you know, the Beatles accomplished so much and have had such a, an ongoing impact that 50 years seems c kind of like a drop in the bucket. But it is that interesting milestone that, you know, they have been around that long. Actually, it's hard to, for, it's hard to believe that we're coming up on, you know, Love Me Do is 50 years old, that in, you know, in two years, the Ed Sullivan Show will be 50 years old. It's just hard to believe that. It is really, mind-boggling. Really and you know, especially because I go on Facebook so much, every single day or every week it's the anniversary of something connected to the Beatles. When you have that well, much history, that's bound to happen. Mm -hmm. But and I think people, that it's important to bring up this particular anniversary only because this is where it all started. Mm -hmm. You know, this was the year when Ringo actually joined and the Beatles became the Fab Four. Right. And, you know, there are people that... Uh, who daily um, are just obsessed with posting, you know, whatever happened to the Beatles on the state. Right. Um, and it gets a little crazy, but 
but yeah, I mean, I like looking at that myself, but I, I'm not totally absorbed in that. You know, I, I care a lot about everything that they did, and I care about what's going on today. Mm-hmm. I'm the same way. I mean, I barely, I barely glance at all those what what they did 50 years ago. I mean, you know, you, you can get to a point where, you know, you can go crazy with that stuff. And it is true what you said about how Paul and Ringo kind of ignored this in a way because, you know, Ringo was asked the question recently, how are you going to celebrate the 50th anniversary of when you joined the Beatles? And he pretty much reacted like it was any other day to him. It's n- there's no difference. He's not he going to dwell on it. He didn't do anything. He, right. he, they went past, past his 50th anniversary, and a lot of people, you know, I saw his Twitter account, a lot of people, um, you know, said stuff to him complimented him but he didn't he didn't make a big deal out of it at all so that you know that's kind of interesting that uh you know the way he looked at it but that's the thing when you're dealing with both paul and ringo they really don't call attention to anniversaries but they certainly have shown pride in having been in the beatles there's no doubt about it you watch the new george martin DVD, and you can see the smiles on on their faces when they're listening back to this music, and so mm-hmm. many other things that have happened with uh, the success of Love in Las Vegas. They're very proud of all this stuff happening and how this music has endured all these years. So I think there's no problem there, but they just don't like too much attention being given to years. And you know, you can carry that into when Paul was uh, celebrating his 70th birthday. It was it wasn't this big fanfare around the world he didn't do anything momentous about it he just spent it at home with his family so that's right that's how they choose to do these kind of things on the other hand ringo ringo did the exact opposite ringo did a big did that uh, the big show at radio city where paul turned up for him that's true and and well that that uh, discounts you know, what i just said <laughs> 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 but i mean i think ringo did that probably you know just because Paul gets a lot of attention anyway, right? Where Ringo doesn't, and I think probably that was a that was an opportunity for Ringo. Maybe he, well, the word is that he didn't know what was going to happen that night, and um, if that's the case, you know, they somebody they pulled one on Barbara pulled one on him, Barbara Bach, his wife, but right. but still, that was that was a lot of fun, and you know, anytime Paul and Ringo get together publicly like that. Um, it's it's fun. There was word that uh, Ringo would have shown up at Paul's Walk of Fame ceremony had Ringo not been down with pneumonia. That's true. Um, and so that would have been that would have been interesting had he shown up there. And if, and that's really kind of I mean that would have made that day even crazier than it was. And because I was I was there and and uh, it was it was kind of it was a lot of fun anyway. But that would have been just insane had Ringo shown up. But uh, obviously he didn't. He couldn't. Hmm. But still, you know, there aren't that many occasions where they do things. The uh, the E three where, where they showed up for Rock Band, you know, that was another time. Right. Where they, you know, where they did that uh, thing together. So they don't do they don't do that kind of stuff very often. But when they do, it it it's usually revolving around a new project. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, let's talk about some of these very significant dates. I think we'll save the deck audition recordings for another show. That's a whole show to itself. Uh, right. June 6th, they were at EMI Studios, number two studios, and they recorded with Pete Best, Besame Mucho, Love Me Do. And then they also recorded P.S. I Love You and Ask Me Why, which I believe those last two songs were erased. So what remains are those, those first two songs, Besame Mucho and Love Me Do, and those turned up on the Beatles anthology, thankfully. And, thankfully. Um, you know, that's a pretty significant date in Beatle history because it's the only time that Pete Best was at a session at EMI with the Beatles and it was at that session that George Martin apparently had said that uh, that Pete you know wasn't good enough he didn't feel comfortable that, with him as a drummer recording these songs with the Beatles and it was because of that that they had to get another drummer there have been so many spins on the on that Pete Best thing um, Pete put out a book um, himself that has a lot of information in it. Spencer Lee had a book called Drummed, Drummed Out, um, that's all about that, you know. But, uh, I mean, basically all, all of it is conjecture. Paul did mention, did talk about it in the uh, McCartney on McCartney radio series, but mm-hmm. he didn't give any, he didn't, it wasn't real specific. But they basically, 
the, I mean, the, the official story is that, that George Martin wasn't happy. But George Martin, you know, never said, or George Martin, I believe, has said that he never said to fire. So, you know, who knows? Mm. You know, it's hard to say. It's hard to say where, where they went. You know what what exactly happened. And Pete, of course, says he has no idea. So. Yeah, I've interviewed him several times, and every time when I asked him, he he has said those exact words. He has no idea why he was fired. And there's some things that we may never know because the relationship that he had with them, unless you were there witnessing it, you're not going to know what really transpired between him and the group. And there could have been a number of reasons why he was let go. And I think this is something we should delve into in another show, because I think it's mm-hmm. a very fascinating topic. Sure. Um, but one of the things that has kind of struck me in recent years about this June 6th audition, if you follow what's been written about that session in Mark Lewison's books, but apparently when Besame Mucho was recorded, Ron Richards, the engineer, was, was there for that. George Martin wasn't. He came in when they were recording Love Me Do. And apparently Ron Richards was very impressed with that song, enough to call George Martin in. But if they also recorded P.S. I Love You and Ask Me Why, the thing that I find really interesting about this session is that when George Martin has talked about the first time that he met the Beatles, he always says that he wasn't really impressed with their material, and the best they could come up with was Love Me Do. And so when I hear a, you know, a quote like that, and he said it several times, I often ask myself, what was wrong with P.S. I Love You and Ask Me Why? <laughs> you know, that's just me, because I think those other songs are great. And Love Me Do has its own appeal to it. It's a simple song, and I love it. You know, I love mm-hmm. the fact that was the Beatles' first single. And it's, it's surprising. It's, it's a very simple song, but it's just well executed. They did exactly what they needed to do on that record. I like the Ringo version. I like the Andy White version. But um, I'm kind of surprised that he wasn't impressed with the other songs. Because I think P.S. I Love You and Ask Me Why are equally as strong and maybe even stronger. Right. Or maybe he thought Let Me Do had more commercial appeal than the others. But, um, you know, when George Martin has said that, it kind of struck me as odd when you learn that they also did those other songs. And they actually rehearsed a lot of material before recording those four songs, but George Martin apparently wasn't there for that. Right, right. Who knows? I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to imagine. I'm looking at the, I'm sitting here looking at the... Uh, uh, Lewison's book now, and it's got the it's got the sheets. Um, he has the sheets printed for the recording session, but um, but they recorded yeah. those four songs in that order: "Besame Mucho," "Love Me Do," "P.S. I Love You," "Ask Me Why." And it is a shame mm-hmm. that you that we we don't have "P.S. I Love You" and "Ask Me Why" to listen to now. Right. But um, when September fourth came around and Ringo was there in the studio, they did two songs: "How Do You Do It" and "Love Me Do." And "How Do You Do It," I think is such an important part of their history. I actually think as years go on, it, it really, to me, it's a pivotal moment in their career, which, was, which people have overlooked. Uh-huh. It was interesting that um, recently Spencer Lee interviewed Jerry Marston, and he played for him the demo right. of How Do You Do It that, uh, that Marston said he had never heard before, which is kind of amazing. Um, I had always thought that Marston had picked up How Do You Do It from a demo, but he picked it up from the Beatles. He got he had heard the Beatles version, right? Which was kind of which was kind of interesting. Yeah, and, the, the Jerry the, and the Pacemakers version was patterned after the Beatle version. Mm-hmm. But the demo sounds just like the, the Beatles version. It's it's very funny. Uh, it's a it's actually a cross between the Beatles version and the Jerry and the Pacemaker version. Well, from what uh, I heard, they had a singer on, on the demo. His name was Barry Mason. And yeah. the, the interesting thing about that recording is, and I just looked at the, the Lewison book again today about this, but he was backed up. Do you know who backed him up on this recording? Members who became the Dave Clark Five. Really? Oh, on the, yeah, on the demo. And I don't remember, because uh, I listened to when, he play, when um, Spencer Lee played this for... For uh, Jerry Marson, I listened to that part of the show, and I don't remember him saying that, but that's that's interesting. That's quite interesting. But originally, that song, How Do You Do It, was intended for Adam Faith to record. Mm-hmm. That's who the demo was for, right? Yeah. But the thing about How Do You Do It is, for, for people who don't know the whole story, since George Martin wasn't really that crazy about the Beatles' material, and like I said, Love Me Do was the best they can come up with, he really wanted to have a surefire hit. 
And so he went to the song How Do You Do It, which was written by Mitch Murray, who's kind of like Tin Pan Alley-esque writer. And right. he was convinced that song would be a hit. And he presented it to the Beatles. Actually, they were given an acetate demo, the, the one that uh, you were just talking about. And so they learned the song. They did it their arrangement. And they did it reluctantly because they wanted their own songs to be singles. And you can really tell that their version is a reluctant version. John has John has no enthusiasm in his vocal, mm. and the background vocals. You know, you, the, nobody's there's no light. There's really not much light, not as much life in that song as there is, for example, in "Please Please Me." Mm. Um, they really made it known that they were not. You know, they didn't really want to do this. You know, very well. And I, I mean, I, I've always liked the song. I've always liked their version. I think, uh, I know I, uh, I remember our local radio station, uh, at the, you know, the first time I heard it, our, lo- one of our local, uh, AM stations had dug the thing up and was playing it, especially one weekend. And they were playing it like every few hours. They weren't playing it very often. So I had to sit there several hours to, to hear the thing. And mm-hmm. I was just like, oh my God. Yeah. This is, this is incredible. And they had a little clip. I believe it was John talking about it just before they went into it. And it was and it was amazing. I just I was just glued to the radio to hear that thing. And I still today love that song. I still I do too. It. I remember when I first heard it, I thought this was good enough to come out. It could have fit on all the early Beatles stuff. It could have been on if you're going by the British releases. It could have fit on Please Please Me. You know, it was a polished recording. It was catchy. It could have been a hit. But from yeah, that's from, it. That's an interesting question in itself because I think I uh, I don't know whether it was you or somebody I had been talking with recently about whether it would have been a hit, and it's very possible that it could have been. I mean, they could, they maybe if they had had uh, put a little more enthusiasm in it and showed a little more confidence in the song, but you know Jerry took it and ran with it and made a big number one hit in the UK. I mean that's great for him. It's one of his it's one of his signature songs. But it would have been interesting to see if, it, you know, if the Beatles had gone with it, what they would have done. Well, that's the thing. I mean, there's so many parts of Beatle history where certain things happened and it benefited the Beatles and it just happened that good fortune went their way. And how do you do it to me has, has become so much more important in Beatle history because George Martin had to make the decision, should I go with Love Me Do or should I go with the song that I really believe in? And if you mm-hmm. followed the fact that Jerry and the Pacemakers version went to number one in the UK and also went top ten in the US, that's proof right there that the song was strong enough to be a hit anyway. But he let the Beatles get their way. Let's just say, for example, it went the other direction. Mm-hmm. Let's just say that the Beatles didn't make that their first single and it was a big hit. George Martin could very well have said, well, I know what I'm doing, guys. I'm going to pick the material for a while if he didn't think that much of the songs they were doing, although we later learned that he really liked Please Please Me. I think you also have to give a little credit there, though, to Jerry Marston for the life he put into that song. Right. Because Jerry is uh, a very uh, outgoing singer. And, again, getting back to the Beatles version, which didn't have that kind of um, enthusiasm in it, Jerry really put a lot of enthusiasm in his version. And... You know, it goes back to whether or not if the Beatles had done the same thing, they would have had as big a hit. It, it's hard to say that they they would have had the same kind of hit as Jerry did with the version that came out, with the version that they did. But even um, if it wasn't as big, even if it went top 10, mm-hmm. you know, that would have been better than Love Me Do, which went to number 17. And we're very lucky that Love Me Do, as much as I love the song and the recording, went that far. It had to have... It had it to impress you with how far it went on the charts for the Beatles to have enough clout where the next single was an original song. And the fact that it went top 20 enabled the Beatles to carry on and have another original single. If Love Me Do had flopped, mm-hmm. you know, we don't know if the next single would have been Please Please Me. I mean, it's hard to envision that now because, you know, Please Please Me became the big hit that it was in England and also it became a big here. So... You don't really know. This is just the way things happened. And it was lucky for the Beatles. It was lucky for Jerry and the Pacemakers. It was lucky for George Martin. Everybody benefited from this. They were on their way up, though. And Love Me Do probably had probably benefited from that. You know, even though it didn't go up as high as, 
you know, as it didn't hit the top ten. They were definitely, um, you know, uh, the, to use the old Dick Clark term, you know, with a bullet. They were they were on the rise. Right. So I don't know that, um, you know, that the, it was the song or themselves that did love, made Love Me Do as big as it was. Oh, I think it was definitely both. You think so? Yeah. But at the same time, I've also heard that even after Love Me Do hit number 17, George Martin was still thinking that How Do You Do It should be the follow-up. Well, I think at that point, they, the Beatles finally probably said, you know, that's it, it's going to be our call. Um, especially because, uh, again, they were they were on the they were on the rise, and I think they probably used a little bit of their, you know, their aggressiveness because they were known to be very aggressive anyway. Well, we're very uh, fortunate at the same time that George Martin gave the approval for right. Love Me Do to be the single, and then for Please Please Me to be the next one, and it was George Martin who suggested that Please Please Me. Uh, become a faster song because originally so we've been told though there's never been any bootleg that has ever surfaced that please please me was a, a slower song very much like a roy orbison ballad <laughs> and apparently george martin suggested to speed it up and uh that was the suggestion that was needed <laughs> one of the many great contributions that george martin made in the arrangements of songs and the suggestions that he made and uh woe be people who complained about uh George Martin not making contributions to the Beatles. Because it's just not true. It's just not true. Oh, it's, it's endless how true. much George Martin did for the Beatles. You know, there's, right. there's a lot more to the success of the music than the strength of the songs. The recordings right. that the Beatles made have endured because of the musicianship of the Beatles and the production behind it and the engineers they work with. It's not just the four of them. There's, a, there's so much that could be said about the people around them and why they were successful. And especially this this first year, this in 1962, as that you know, as um, their work with him showed that uh, and Martin Martin had had you know a lot of influence that first year, and the reason is because he you know he was very experienced and he he knew what he was doing in the studio and you know the Beatles were still a little a little new but not you know they still were I mean they were definitely talented but they were also new right and and george's guidance you know really helped start them on their way so on september 4th they recorded how do you do it and love me do with ringo on drums and the version that came out as the single in england actually was the one with ringo on it mm -hmm. although uh the following week george martin had brought in a session drummer andy white and they recorded let me do again p.s i love you and Ringo was relegated to playing tambourine on Love Me Do and right. the Rockas on P.S. I Love You. And they also recorded Please Please Me during that session, which sometimes people might not be aware of, with Andy White drumming. And that version also turned up on the Beatles anthology, which is very interesting to listen to because it's pretty close to the version with Ringo on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, there was so much of that stuff going on. It's funny how uh, it's, you know that stuff kind of dropped off later when they when they... Once they hit it big, obviously, you know they were in control. You right. Know, it was kind of the the other way around, but they in in the beginning, you know, things these strange things happened, and and you know the Beatles um, had to you know the uh, changes that George Martin made were were very important and very significant. Mm hmm. But it's kind of interesting that between that week, September fourth and eleventh. You know, George Martin didn't feel comfortable enough with Ringo on drums, and then they brought Andy White in, and yet the version that became the single in the UK was the one with Ringo on it, mm -hmm. which is surprising, <laughs> in a right. way. And the version that became the hit here in America was the one with a with Andy White on it. Right. So you could get the Ringo one on uh, uh, in Canada. The, Can the Canadian single had the, the Ringo version. Right. But, and the uh, one that turned but, up on the Please Please Me album was the one with Andy White. Right. So it gets a little confusing, but um, it's nice to have the two different versions. And it's also nice that um, Capital EMI are recognizing it by releasing this single for the 50th anniversary. Mm -hmm. And it's also nice that they dug out the, the Pete Best version uh, for, uh, the anthology. for the anthology. Right. Well, you know what's interesting about that is because if you listen to that version, it slows up and speeds down. The tempo is not consistent. 
So I'm kind of wondering, when you listen to that, thinking what was going on in George Martin's mind when he thought maybe Pete Best wasn't good enough in the studio, if you listen to that version, it's very noticeable. He slows down and speeds up. It's just, um, you know, it doesn't have the steady beat that the versions with Ringo and Andy White had. So I'm wondering if that might have been what triggered George Martin to think this about Pete. Right. Uh, you can go to the, the deck auditions and see what he did there. Even listen to what he has done since, and, you know, Pete Best is a, is a very basic drummer. He's not, he doesn't have the flourish that Ringo does. So, um, uh, you know, it's, it, it, but there's a whole, there's a whole issue there. I mean, again, we, you know, we don't want to get into the, the personality versus, you know, the image and all that stuff. But, right. you know, who knows, who knows what, what happened. Well, Ringo became so incredibly creative as a drummer during the Beatle years. And um, I know that Pete was asked the question, would he have been able to do the same thing that Ringo did? And his answer was that he wouldn't know unless he was in that situation. Right. When you're with people that creative, it kind of encourages you to be more creative. Right. So he might have been more interesting as a drummer than on those early records. We'll never know. Right. But what we do know is that Ringo really flourished. And right. he proved to be the perfect fit, the final piece of the puzzle. And that all happened 50 years ago, this year. Right. Which is pretty amazing when you think about it. The whole idea, I mean, 50 years doesn't mean an end. No I one's saying that. that. <laughs> no, I know, I know. I guess what I'm saying is, you know, 50 years, is, the, the whole 50 year thing is just kind of like, um, you know, a, a small milestone because obviously the Beatles have proved, especially in the last few years, that they're they're going to be around a lot longer. The mu and we're not talking about things like Rock Band, which was obviously a, an attempt to to prolong them, or even Love, which was the same thing. But the music itself is going to endure, and that's that actually is probably the most astounding thing of all that that music 50 years ago is going to is going to hang in. You know, I mean, it, it's you can compare it to Elvis. Um, the 50th anniversary, their influence will go on, you know, for year, for many, many years, many years. That's true. I mean, to me, the timelessness factor is far more important. But I'm not someone that lives and breathes anniversaries. But it's nice to mm -hmm. call attention to them as they happen. Maybe not every single one of them. But I definitely think that the 50th anniversary of their first single is worth giving attention to and doing a show on. So that puts a wrap on this show. I'm Ken Michaels. Thanks so much for listening. Uh, if anyone is interested, they can find out more about me and my own Beatles program, music program called Every Little Thing, on my own website, which is kenmichaelsradio.com. You'll find interviews with people in the Beatle world on there, as well as trivia posted every week and lots of great prizes given out as well. Steve, how can people find out about you and your work with Beatles Examiner? Um, I'm on examiner.com uh, under Beatles Examiner. Uh, search for me under Beatles Examiner. And I'm on uh, Facebook un under my own name and Twitter uh, under my own name. And um, just look for me. And you can find the uh, our podcast on iTunes and fab4radio.com. That's right. And we also have our own Facebook page for things we said today. And you can also find my Facebook page, Ken Michaels. My profile picture, which has changed since the last time I told you about this, is me hanging out with Todd Rundgren, <laughs> which, you know, that was, that's, that's a whole show to itself, uh, along with my wife and Todd's wife. So look for me and Todd, and you'll know that's me. And I'll instantly friend you. Okay, so <laughs> thanks so much for listening to Things We Said Today, and we'll see you next time.